we're going to have Gary again is going to describe a very particular relationship, which is the harmonic relationships of circles, cones, spheres, and natural structures that they create. Gary? All right, I'll, I'll get going. Um, again, I'll, hopefully the slides will take me through this, um, and I'll, I'll try to uh, not embarrass myself too much. Uh, but basically, about a year and a half ago, I just kind of tripped across something, kind of found a loose thread, kind of tugging at it, didn't know where it was going to lead. And then slowly, it just sort of came together. Um, I didn't have anyone to talk about it, so I just started documenting what I was, what I was learning. <clears throat> Essentially, I, I just used a compass and a sphere and was just drawing on it, looking for certain relationships. But before I start, I wanted to go back and, and, and actually go what I found on, this, on your websites here though, of what people have done in the past couple of decades. Um, Magnus was someone I met about a month ago, and I, I spent a month with him, and he helped me with, with some of my work. And he builds these, you know, cool polytron models out of paper. Um, this is something Joe sent me that I think he we just did probably 10, 20 years ago. And I, I can relate exactly to some of these shapes. Um, he also referred me to Flower Day, which unfortunately passed away some time ago. But all these shapes here, whoops, you know, I, I've got some on the table here, the exact same shapes we're seeing here. So, you know, people have been doing this for quite some time. Um, flower of life pattern, I'll, I'll actually get back to as well. Um, Can a snail film is actually so close to what I've been doing, and I was just blown away by what he's done. Um, and we all know Don's work, and I'm trying to find some way to twist my work into what he's doing. Um, that might take a fourth dimension that uh, I haven't found yet. Um, and Dick Feshbook, I, when I saw his work, I said, look at those cones, I, I, I get that. And then, of course, Bucky you know, has the same kind of approach. <clears throat> So basically, just one step at a time, I started seeing that you know, structure was falling at the path of least resistance from simple structures to more complex structures. And just to set some groundwork, you know, basically, if you look in flatland geometry, Euclidean geometry, um, this basic relationship here between a hexagon and a circle enables this geometric tiling. And you can basically you know, go on indefinitely and, and make this really cool patterns. So where I, where I defined, I guess, what I call here a, a new geometric model based on spherical geometry. And it basically resol resolves around basically drawing this circle, which I, I call it a conics to differentiate it from just a regular circle on, on a flat plane. But what's unique about this conics is that it has actually four radius. It's got two conical radiuses, one at the top, one at the bottom. It's got a planar radius that cuts through the plane that's intersect. And actually, this could apply to any length greater than zero. So I mean, geometry will apply even at the smallest dimensions. And basically, so this is the model I use to um, essentially play around. Uh, and it's also funny, as, as I was preparing these slides this weekend, um, I actually have a whole new chapter I want to add to my book. So I basically, it's, it's that green that I realized I've, I've actually missed a lot of things. And, and, I, and that's why I'm here, too. I, I want to share this with, you know, some bright people to see how you could maybe apply it or, or add to it or, you know, correct what I may be doing wrong. And, and this is just what I, what I vision as any, any cone defines actually a sphere and actually these three cones define the same sphere. It's just its apex is located at three different locations. Um, and I, I kind of see that as a cone being that bridge between a two-dimensional circle and a three-dimensional sphere. And it's, it's a relationship between you know, what are one of the four radii in, in this relationship. And this is just an example of, of how the, the relationship 
you know, I, I got here this conical radius, you know, center at the top of the sphere, and it, it can grow and grow and grow. The planar radius, you know, kind of grows at a slower rate, in fact, and then starts shrinking again. And, and that, you'll see how important that kind of plays in these, these relationships. <clears throat> and basically, this is, this is ground zero. Um, if I could just spend a few seconds with where this all started. About a year and a half ago, I just became obsessed with tetrahedrons. And I was drawing or building all shapes and sizes. Um, I don't know if you ever saw a movie um, with Richard Dreyfus, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. He was obsessed with building that devil's tower out of mashed potatoes and in his garden. Well, my wife was started saying, what are you doing? You know, I, I have 30-foot tetrahedrons in my backyard swinging my kids around on it. And, um, and at one point, I thought, actually, I invented a, a cool beach tent made out of a tetrahedron. And I've got some close friends in Ottawa, Canada. I, I said, I'm going to go up there, show them my ID, and start a business. Um, I showed it to them, and it was, they were underwhelmed. You know, so it was, you know, I said, OK, well, you know, that, that, you know, I haven't seen you guys in a while, so let's just have, you know, chill out and have some fun. And the day before I left, a close friend of mine, Jim McCarthy, he says, Gary, he says, uh, so I know you. And I said, I don't think you want to get bogged down in starting a business and worrying about the finances. And he says, you, you do your best work in, your sh in the shower. You know, go home and just invent something. You know, go back to inventing. And, and actually, I had a nine-hour drive to go home. I said, you know, I think he's right. And it, it did free me up a little bit from the business aspect of it. And, but I, I still stayed on this little tetrahedron kick. And I, I made a whole series of tetrahedrons out of modeling clay. And I just started putting them together to see what it would, would build. And then this shape, yeah, I, I call it a hedron. I'm not sure if I can pronounce it. I've never seen it before. But I, I just immediately saw the sphere that encompassed the vertices of it. And I said, well, you, you, that, you, you could find these with a compass. I mean, I, it just seems so natural that you'd better locate them. So I have a couple of slides to show you what I, just, what I did. But I have a small little video that I might put in more perspective. But this is kind of this is a top view, you know. This is the North Pole, you know. The red is the outer part of the sphere. The conix is in blue, and it's just, you know. So I draw a circle, and then I use that radius, and I, I have a reference mark here. And much like dividing a circle into six segments on a flat plane, I, I attempt to do the same thing here, expecting to divide it into six. Um, in fact, this case, whatever I chose, it was, it was. It wasn't six. So I said, well, OK, what? So let me change the radius. So I changed the radius to be a little bit smaller. This time it marked off five arc segments, but it was still missing something. And then, sort of by fluke and trial and error, actually, I did actually lock into finding the right radius that divided this conix into five equal arc segments and then defined a, a, a pentagon in the. Um, now, maybe it's a good time to. Play my video. So I, I call this a fifth harmonic, just based on the, on the pentagon. Uh, this, is, this is fast speed, so I don't really draw this fast, by the way. Um, you make a reference mark, and this will probably line up a little bit with what I showed in the slides. I missed out on that final marking, so I've got to increase the radius just a little bit. But you have to erase everything and start over again, so you make sure the circles are cons the radius is consistent. Now, you can probably guess what's going to happen this time, um, but now it's too long. So I know it's somewhere in between where I started, and again, start from the beginning. At this point, if it's the same video, I expect it's going to line up perfectly. And that, I call that, now that's a fifth harmonic conix. So the, 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 the compass is tuned to the fifth harmonic right now. And now I'm just taking the, the, the same approach you take drawing the flower of life, and you just you make sure you just center the compass where other circles intersect, and you just continue the process. And after 12 circles, or 12 conics, the whole pattern converges upon itself. Um, and you'll see shortly that where those circles intersect to find precisely where all the vertices of a icosahedron are. You know, so buried in that, that simple sphere and that simple conics is directly related to some platonic solids.
And when I, when I saw this for the first time, I, I got chills down the back of my neck, and this, I, I want to find out more about this. And I looked for months. There was just nothing on the Internet that was, was close to that. So that was just the same thing I showed here, but in, in video form. Um, and, and quite simply, it's just a compass is locating the vertices on it. It looks simple now, but um, at the time, I didn't quite know where I was headed. Um, after a while, after I actually I drew hundreds of these patterns before I said, well, is, is there a fourth harmonic? You know, I mean, it's, why wouldn't there be? Um, and that just required the radius to increase slightly to the point where, where now <laughs> the markings of the radius mark off <coughs> and describe square. That, that's the top view, and, and actually this is more from a side view. And this is one special case where actually these are great circles that are involved. And the resulting what I call a harmonic note. This would be the basic fourth harmonic note here. Um, so, so at that point, I say, well, to give it some legitimacy, um, is there a, a general formula I could use to tell me why, I just, why this exists at all? Um, so I, I went back to my, my basic geometric model here. And if I go ahead, I think I can show you. There's, there's three basic triangles that are interrelated to each other. And you know, there's a very simple geometric relationship here with this triangle. This other triangle here is just simple, you know, another trig relationship here. And in this case, this is just the a chord angle of the inscribed pentagon, just described in this manner. And it's just by substitution, these are just come down to a very simple, this angle <laughs> omega is a function of just w which is the chord angle. And if now if I plug in W for the pentagon or for, for the square, it corresponds exactly with, with the measurements I, I found. Uh, but now I can go, go on and explore, is there a third harmonic? Because I know if it's an inscribed triangle, um, this is the chord angle. And this turns out to be predicting what the radius is. Now what was a little bit difficult to deal with is that with this length of conical radius, the compass goes into the southern hemisphere, and now your point is perpendicular to the surface of the sphere, and it just doesn't stay well. So, now, so initially, I thought I could take a shortcut and use the shorter radius that would be on the south pole to draw it, um, and that, that didn't converge on a pattern, so I had no choice but essentially to, you know, create a spherical compass that could get to reach down into the southern hemisphere. Um, and that, that enabled, you know, the harmonics, you know, below the fourth harmonic to be to discovered. You know, so actually I can show you the pictures here. So actually, in this case here now, the conics here was below the equator. And, and that, that's difficult to draw with, with, a, with a classical compass. But then you'd actually move your compass down to the conics itself and start marking off. And, and once you get it tuned correctly, now you've got the equilateral triangle. And at that point, all the platonic solids were kind of, well, the main platonic solids were all discovered. And actually, it's okay, Mike, I'll, I'll move on. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. Okay. Um, so I said, is there anything beyond the third harmonic? Um, if I looked at the trend from the fifth harmonic, it's a pentagon to a squared or triangle, there wasn't a two-sided polygon, so I, did, I didn't look for a month or two. Until I said, well, you know, I'll, I'll just take, you know, what the progression would be in a chord angle. Would, the next step would be 2 pi over 2. Um, and it, it predicted a conical radius of root 3. Uh, so I, I went ahead and basically started constructing that. Again, it is more difficult with the length of this conical radius. And what I found out by, by mistake was I was using a lead pencil in the beginning. And... As the lead pencil started wearing down, the radius started changing. So it took me days to converge on a pattern because the radius kept on changing for each new circle I was drawing. Um, so that, that, was, that, that was frustrating. I, was, I spent three days until I started using a dry, a dry erase marker that didn't kind of wear down and made me converge a little earlier. But this was a little bit of a little different relationship because now there's no overlap what we were seeing in the previous ones. They just fully abut each other and create 
three abutted conics. And I didn't recognize what that was until about a month later. And actually, it's related to a triangular prism. Um, so you know, so we've got the platonic solids, and then what we found here in the second harmonic is, is a triangular prism. I, I have read in some books some special relationships and what that may mean. I, I don't know, to tell you the truth. Um, but th this whole second harmonic has a lot of interesting relationships. What would fit in this void here is a, uh, is a circle of a, a half inch or half, half a unit. It just, it's a perfect fit. Um, there's two other views of the second harmonic. So, so just to review now, so at this point, you know, I've discovered four new harmonics. I call them fifth, fourth, third, and second. And that's, you know, they kind of relate to each other here. And just an open question to myself and others, it's like, you know, which one would, would come first? If there was an order, is one simpler than the other? Um, I don't quite have, have an answer, but I think it's a provocative question. Uh, if I, I, and then I, I, I looked at, I, I didn't think there was much beyond a second harmonic because beyond a conic rays of root three, the circles don't interact anymore. They don't abut, so I, I didn't look any deeper, at least at this point. But I, I looked in the other direction and say, what is up above the fifth harmonic, which you know would be called a sixth harmonic, and it would require an inscribed hexagon. Um, or if I plug in the results into the general solution, it says your radius is zero. So that means you've got a, a circle of radius zero, and it has an inscribed hexagon. Kind of conflicting to some extent, unless my interpretation is, well, it's tell me that when you've got no curvature, then the inscribed pentagon would be a hexagon, which is our flatland Euclidean world, I, I suppose. I, and that's an observation and speculation on my part still. <coughs> but if, if you see now, actually, let me do a little animation here. Um, so if you look progressively from the second to the third and up to the fifth harmonic, and the radius is decreasing, it converges to the little point where the sixth is predicted. You expand that area in space. Well, now you can see the, the inscribed hexagon in what well, is a small circle, if it exists. Um, just an observation. I, I'm not really not making any, any point here. So basically, at that point, basically, everything I discovered was just all the vertices were located. It didn't really locate the faces. It didn't locate the edges of the polyhedra or the platonic solids. But they're actually quite easy to find just by triangulating from the, from the vertices to the locate the faces and the edges. So now at this point, I've got a sphere for this. You now, each harmonic has their own relationships here. But this fourth harmonic has six vertices, eight faces, and 12 edges. That's a lot of points on a sphere to play with. So I just started essentially drawing conics of all different sizes aligned to particular axes. And I just came up with some nomenclature that for any of uh, the harmonic notes that are aligned to the vertices, I call it a V note. I won't go over the nomenclature here, but it's, it basically just tells you the size of the conics and which other axis it intersects with. Um, so, I, you know, so I went ahead and just basically drew them all out. Um, basically, you know, that this is the smallest, the smallest conic size, and they, they fully abut. And then as the conic gets larger and larger, they, they become fully, elapped, fully overlapped, and they now become great circles. And, uh, and interestingly, I guess you might recognize as cuboctahedron. Well, this is a projection of one on a sphere surface, just kind of a natural outcome of, of one of these harmonics. Um, and I guess the E notes are basically just you know, drawn here. A lot of these I can see which other polyhedra they're related to. Um, some are a little bit more complicated. I haven't really, I don't know what these other intersection points mean just yet. So at that point, actually, I. I Instead of drawing on a wooden sphere, I said, what if I take the wooden sphere away and I just use metal rings to construct a virtual sphere? Um, I, I just enjoy the artistic piece of this. And, and what, what, I, what I did then was, that for all the harmonic notes, my geometric reference was a sphere itself. So it was a unit sphere, and it was the size of the conics that varied and created the different patterns. When I, I just went out and bought a bunch of metal rings that were all a unit diameter, unit radius, and as I now rearrange this on the sphere, the radius of the sphere changed. So now I just turn the, um, 
turn, turn things around a bit, and I, I call these things polyspherons, and they, they now have kind of a growth rate based on whatever harmonic node it's based on. You know, so to give an example here, this is the fourth harmonic note, this is the fourth harmonic polyspheron, the sphere is removed, but the conics themselves still support the structure. Um, now if we look at the, again, back to the harmonic notes, the sphere stays the same size, the conic goes through various, you know, decrease steps. If I, if I turn that around, now these are just kind of scaled out harmonic notes. Um, so now I keep the conics the same size, but you notice the sphere now increases in, you know, various steps. And, and, and this is, this is the linear increase. I haven't looked at what the area and volume increases, but there'd be, you know, some sort of quantitized step there as well. And, and this, is, this is kind of a composite view of what we just saw on this previous page. And what is probably a little bit misleading here is if you look at this one, this looks like there's actually three conics on the sphere, but in fact, each one of these are a pair of conics. There's actually six. And that becomes more apparent here where this, this center is, is the smallest conics. And these white arrows indicate that how it splits in two. And this, and this one become split from one. And then the red, out, the red arrows indicate the further expansion to the, the, the larger um, polyspheron. And it kind of gives it kind of a geometric memory. Um, in fact, I, I've, I do want to work on a way to actually physically represent this by taking any one of the polyspherons and be able to expand and collapse it um, in, in a physical model. Um, I haven't got there yet. But, you know, oops. You know, but each, each one of these steps are the discrete, the discrete quantities that um, are very simple fractions or fractions of roots. Now, this, this next step is, this is, now I'm into the third phase of, of my structures. And this is just a kind of a vague, they don't think, don't relate that to anything you've seen earlier, but what I'm trying to de demonstrate here is that if you go back to these, the largest of these polyspherons where they're fully abutted, well now I just say, now each conic is going to grow at a uniform rate. And in doing so, it's going to trace out a cone pattern as it expands. So if you look at it in sequence now, we've got the harmonic note here, you get the polysphere on it, now increases in size. And then now as the conics themselves uniformly grow, it's going to trace out a cone structure. Um, and now it can grow much, much larger. And it also now has more increased rigidity in structure because now we've got the surface of the, of the cone that's going to support the structure. Um, I haven't finished that slide yet. Um, now this is just a view, the various views of what I call the hexaconics. Um, but what's interesting though that there are various ways now these things can build upon themselves and, and grow and bond in various ways. You know, this bond right here is kind of a flexible bond. It, it, it's, it stays in place, but it's got some flexibility. Um, when you join it at the vertices, it's very rigid and it's, you know, it's, it's not for, it doesn't bend. Um, now you can also now take the cones themselves and just kind of you know break apart the hexaconics, and all these nice cone shapes. There's an indefinite manner, a number of patterns that these things can, can form, just with their you know their natural shapes. Um, what became more interesting was by truncating these cones, it kind of gets the apex out of the way and doesn't interfere with itself as much. And this kind of leads to even more complex. And I, I'm not making any predictions or, or any statements here, just observing what structure could evolve into. Um, and then here are just a few things that probably can visualize a little better. I'll just go through these quickly. But now you can see how these things can continue to grow and grow, um, just li only limited by your imagination. And, you know, some of these almost, almost get to almost organic in nature. Um, I'm not sure what it means either. Um, you know, you can even, you know, combine different size shapes and just they kind of self-couple each other. Um, oh, that was a question that you get a free book if you can answer this one. Um, but actually, I think that's about it. Um, I don't know if we have any time for questions or... Yeah, we have.
Uh, Gary, uh, in the, um, the last models, you're using uh, face-centered magnets to hold the sections together. Correct. You might want to try to use edge-centered magnets as well and see what that does. You mean what, what, what uh, Snelling? I think it was a Snelling's. I, I think I've seen some stuff on Snelling's has the magnets are almost perpendicular to. Uh, right. Yeah. If you had a ring magnet at, yeah. at each end, you know that that might yeah make that, some... that might open up a whole new right venue. Of, yeah, yeah. yeah I, just, I like that. Gary, could you uh, show us some of your models? Give yeah. us some close-ups on the video. Um, and any other question? Well, no. Let's let him. <laughs> Hold a question. Well, actually, I'll, I'll show you what started this whole thing. Did you get, did you get the mic? Oh, yeah, thank you. Actually, this is just that little piece of, is this on? This on? Yeah. yeah. This is just a little piece of modeling clay that actually kind of started my curiosity. Um, and, it, and actually, I, I should also say that 20 tetrahedrons do not make uh, a costahedron. Um, it was a soft clay, so it was kind of forgiving. I was almost devastated when I found out about a week later when I actually ordered some uh, tetrahedral dice and started gluing them together, and they didn't fit. And I said, what did I do wrong? Um, I, I soon found out that it's not a volume relationship, it's a more of a surface area relationship. So once I came to terms with that, I, I moved on and I wasn't so disappointed. Um, you know, I, I probably spent a better part of, of several months just, I, did, I didn't show it, there's much more in my book on basically other variations and you can dive into this stuff into infinite detail. You know, this is a, this is a harmonic chord, I would call it, where it's a mixture of harmonic notes. Not sure what it means, you know, this is pure beauty is one thing, uh, and is there an application? I, I'm not sure yet, and that's why hopefully maybe some people here might be able to use some of these ideas. Um, so that was my harmonic note phase. Um, then I moved on to the polyspheron phase, and basically, I was going to take every harmonic note and just construct it with rigid rings. And I'd actually, here's an example of a dodecahedron where there are six notes involved. But I have the smallest note on the inside and the largest note on the outside. And it's a very rigid structure. And I, again, like I said earlier, if I can get the, the hinges correct, I should be able to compress this down by twisting the circles down into the smaller unit, or vice versa, pulling it out. Um, I, I got a feeling there could be some sort of molecular relationship or, or atomic relationship here that that's not my background, so I, I, I can't really do much with that. Um, and then, uh, other than, well, I, you, you've seen some of these hexaconics. Um, again, you know, they, they come apart and make you know, various other shapes, you know, planes, it's, it's very flexible. Um, th this is the example of a, a you know kind of a flexible you know bonding, as opposed to one that just broke that was rigid. Uh, <laughs> I guess it wasn't that rigid. Uh, <laughs> or, or I need stronger magnets. Um, now, I, I just probably kind of hard to see, but the, 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 the finer you make the ring, and the more magnets you add to it, gives it even you know more flexibility to make almost spiral, almost DNA-like kind of structures to it as well. Uh, again, I have no idea what the application is, or if there is any, other than just looking kind of cool. Um, and you guys are free to come up and take a look at this later. Um, I'll leave it out until, until lunchtime. Any other, any other questions? We still have uh, two minutes. Yes, uh, Karen. I was just wondering if you've ever seen, um, there's a traditional Japanese craft called temari, yeah. that the mechanism for dividing up the ball uses a pin in one position and thread wrapped around so that you get the, basically the same thing you were doing with the um, dry erase, but you're doing it by measuring that length out with a piece of thread. Um, I was wondering if you'd seen that. There's an incredible diversity of forms that are very similar to the design you've come up with here. In fact, that was probably one of the first hits I did see when I, you know, when I was surfing the internet to look for anything similar. And uh, I mean, it looks like a fascinating science. And it's been, it's been around for quite some time. 
if I, if I believe, if I understand it correctly, it's all great circles. I don't think they used any small circles in, in the arrangement. I mean, it doesn't take anything away from it. Um, but I mean, I, I, I was actually curious what drove them. I, I, I try to look if there's any geometry behind what they were doing, you know, that could describe it. I mean, it looked like a pure art form, which was a beautiful. Um, but no, I, I have seen it and very, very impressed by it. Um, it was it just an intuitive uh, feel? It, it, it's like like an art form I would take. Right? Yeah, I, I, you know, it's I, an I, I, I'm sorry. It's yeah. an intuitive art form, you know, and, and, and that's what makes it, I think, so creatively elegant. Uh, now, is, how is that art passed on to others? Is it just sort of basic artistic? Uh... Well, the the Asian way is is, is much more, you know, uh, uh, teaching, you know, the 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 the, the, the way that uh, you know, master teaching class and this is the way they like to pass things down. Yeah. I think they, they did that for three reasons. Number one, so it could be a hands-on, which of course comes back to Bucky's idea. And number two, so the master, as, they, as you know, that's the, the, the process to could, could, could kind of see how good this, the student really was to pass on more secrets and more secrets. This was just the, the, the Asian elegant way. Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, that's yeah, yeah, another example, you know, I, I probably only sh I showed maybe a half a dozen examples at the beginning of the presentation, and there are many more like you suggest. I, I, I've been, somehow I found a way to relate it to geometry, and, and I think that's a common underlying thread um, that may help, you know, make, you know, other applications for this, you know, feasible. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you.